Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in episode 10 of Andor. Now there is a lot for us to break down in this episode. The hidden meanings of Mon Mothma's storyline, Easter eggs to the rest of Star Wars, and how this whole episode is symbolic for the rise of the Rebellion. But first, I just gotta say, this is shaping up to be my favorite Star Wars show. I love The Mandalorian, I love Clone Wars, but this show is taking the franchise to a new level. Every time the show shifts to a new setting, we get at least one episode where we're immersed in this world, getting to know the characters. So when the big action set piece happens, like in episode 10, the payoff is so much richer. So you may have noticed the opening music is changing for every episode. For every episode's opening credits, one or two instruments are being added, making the credits sound more grand as we go through the show. For example, episode one's credits start off relatively simple, but with episode two, you can hear the addition of stringed instruments. In episode three, you can hear the addition of a percussion instrument and so on. We think it's because throughout the show, Cassian's character is being fleshed out, with different elements added on with every new experience. We also think the addition of each instrument is determined by what's happening in the episode. For example, in episode three's opening credits, we hear the addition of a percussion instrument that is often found in traditional indigenous music. In that same episode, we see flashbacks of young Cassa being taken in front of Canari by Marva and Clem. And by episode four, fast and intense drums are added on due to the high stakes robbery mission. But episode 10's opening credit does sound a lot more hopeful than it has in the past. So the episode begins with Ulof getting bagged and thrown out like trash, which is what these men are to the Empire. R.I.P. Ulof. And by the way, if the actor looks familiar, it's because in 1989 he teed up Michael Keaton's most famous line of all time. What are you? I'm Batman. His trolley is being elevated by anti-grav, which we've seen used to move freight before in Star Wars. Now, it was heartbreaking that they still had to walk the guy through the floor where he worked his life away. Even when he's dead, he cannot escape the assembly line. Now, the most important character in the prison storyline is not Cassian, it's Kino Loy. Kino Loy is the stand-in for the regular working class dude who just wants to do his job, keep his head down, and stay out of trouble. The entire episode hinges on his willingness to step up and lead his men into an escape. So it's fitting that he's the first close-up of the episode, as we can see him turning this over in his mind. When Cassian urges him to escape, he says that they don't have enough guards, and they're afraid. Right now, they're afraid. And then Kino says they killed a hundred men just to keep them quiet. I call that power. Power. Power those in panic. So a few things to address here. Cassian points out that whatever they're making is something that the Empire needs. And more than likely, they're making main components for Project Stardust, aka the Death Star. Now the novel, Thrawn Treason, and the movie Rogue One showed us that the first Death Star was always running behind schedule. Hence, why the Empire is forcing these men to work so hard. Because they're afraid of the Emperor's retaliation. But more important here is how Cassian understands the power of fear. Fear is the root of the Empire. The Emperor has power through the dark side of the Force, and the dark side, at its core, is driven by fear, like Master Yoda said. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The Emperor wants the government afraid of him, so the government will inspire fear in the people. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. But Cassian sees through this. He knows that fear of the Empire is actually their weakness. Power those in panic. And this is because fear only creates the illusion of power, and what fear actually creates is rebellion. The Empire built the Death Star as an instrument of fear, but its destruction rallied systems to the cause of the Alliance. And this sentiment is said out loud right here. I'd rather die trying to take them down than die giving them what they want. And this is what Luthen has wanted all along. We need the fear. We need them to overreact. We need them coming down hard. Oppression breeds rebellion. Hey Doug, what would you say is the best day of your life? Oh, let me think. Today? What? Why today? I don't know, I'm just sitting here with you, talking about movies, egg and egg earlier. Why do you ask? I just think that when you have a special day, like the day you first saw the Avengers, or you had an egg, it's good to celebrate it. For instance, I had this made up. This is a star map of how the stars were aligned on the day you and I met. That's very nice. This was made by Underlucky Stars. They're the sponsor of this video. Underlucky Stars creates a personalized star map showing the unique alignment of the stars in a place and time chosen by you. This is actually a great gift to remember an important moment in your life. All you have to do is enter the time and location and they create a print of the sky. This shows the constellations and locations of all the stars showing how they were aligned at your special moment. It's a personalized gift where you can pick from more than 15 designs, 
use a commemoration message and the title. It's durable and it'll last for generations. But how do they know what the stars look like on that very same day? Well, Under Lucky Stars has proprietary methods of locating stars that have been verified by NASA astrophysicists to ensure their accuracy. This also makes a great surprise gift. Every time you look at your map, it's a sweet reminder of your anniversary or when you met your spouse or when you ate some eggs. There was a very tasty egg. Under Lucky Stars also supports and fundraises for the International Dark Sky Association, which is dedicated to limiting light pollution and space litter so we can all actually see the stars in the sky. So Under Lucky Stars is offering Screen Crush viewers an exclusive 10% discount on any order with the code Screen Crush. Go to underluckystars.com slash Screen Crush and get your star map now. Now back to what I was saying. Now last week I pointed out the many similarities this prison episode has with George Lucas's first feature THX 1138 and Cassian points out another one. They don't have enough guards and they know it. This is similar to THX, where the humans were controlled by machines and their daily job was to build more machines. Now back on Coruscant, Dedra is looking at a star map that's very reminiscent of the star charts that we saw in A New Hope. Very cool. Yeah, well, you know what's going on with that story? It's very confusing. Okay, so a couple episodes ago, Luthen tried to get Saul to work with one of the leaders of a rebel cell. This was a guy named Krieger. The man is an ox. Slow and stupid. One of Krieger's pilots was captured by the Empire and was interrogated by Dr. Gorst. That's the evil guy who made Bix listen to screaming children. The pilot told the Empire about a planned rebel raid. That's Krieger's raid, the one that Luthen was trying to get Saul to join. Krieger needs air support. I'm not for hire. Think of it. But the Empire didn't want Krieger to know that they captured the pilot, so they killed the poor guy and made it look like an accident. So this is all the Empire setting up a trap to kill Krieger? Exactly, and this is why Lonnie goes to talk to Luthen later on. And I just want to shout out real quick how appropriate it is that this guy has an 80s mustache and that so many people in this show have 80s hair because it's consistent with the look and feel of the original trilogy that this is set just before. It also gives you the sweet, sweet member berries. Yes, it does. <laughs> So we have two main storylines in this episode. One is about trapping Krieger and the other is about trying to escape a trap. And then we have Lonnie, trapped in his role as a spy, trying to escape the rebellion and live a normal life. But more on that in a second. And back at the prison, Kino says, We are done with counting shifts. Because counting down your days only gives you the hope of release one day. And now the inmates have to decide, are they going to be dead or alive? This has parallels with Red's brilliant monologue in The Shawshank Redemption. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. In the hallway, the inmates are told that there is a new policy and they must be silent. And this takes us directly to Ferrix. And notice that now, in all the Ferrix scenes, we hear the constant chirping of Imperial probe units, which are never silent. It's also a subtle reminder that everyone is now being watched, except for the people in the prison. Marva is dying, so the Empire is watching her closely in case Cassian escapes to see her, which is similar to another great prison movie, Cool Hand Luke, where Luke escapes prison to go to his mother's funeral. To emphasize how the Empire is always watching them, Senta is able to clock an Imperial spy. The government has eyes and ears everywhere, or at least that's what they want everyone to believe, like Andor said in the last episode. Nobody's listening. Nobody. And then we go to another storyline where a rebel is feeling trapped, Mon Mothma. She meets with a very successful gangster named Davos, kind of like the smuggler Davos in Game of Thrones, who Stannis later named as his master of ships. Now this conversation was such a masterclass in how polite society says everything with a double meaning that it could have been written by Oscar Wilde. Her wrote the importance of being earnest, the play that Mary Jane is in in Spider-Man 2. Oh yeah, I gotcha, I remember that. All right, so I wanna do something different here. I wanna go through their conversation and break down what they actually mean with everything they say. The conversation starts off with Davos saying that he's been in this apartment 30 years before when a different Chandrillan senator lived there. Suppose I thought I'd be coming back regularly. Here he's saying, a gangster like me is never allowed in the corridors of power. Mon Mothma responds with, It's state property. Which is her saying, oh, it's nothing. I'm a servant of the people. And then she goes on to say that they're not allowed to change the decor. Davos replies, But one of the indulgences of great wealth is freedom from other people's opinions. I don't care what people think of me, I do what I want. After Mon shuts him down, Tay says, The senator has many obligations. She's learned to manage her time accordingly. Make it quick before this whole thing blows up. I like when things are clear. But then I always get to thinking, What's around the corner? I have a lot of money, but I want more. Your curiosity has clearly been profitable. I need your money, and I have nothing more to give you. I've met your husband several times. I am familiar with your personal life, and you're not that far above me. It's also maybe implied here that her marriage was arranged, which would explain a lot, like why she and her husband hate each other, and why Davos thinks that she'll be open to betrothing her daughter to his son later on. I'm sure. <laughs> 
Ah, but my husband is an asshat, and so are you. I take it that's not a corner we're turning in this conversation. It is not. Oh, we can't talk about your family? Remember, he's trying to lay the groundwork to marry his kid to her daughter. Many cultures don't fully appreciate the clarity of the Chandrillan marriage. I think it's fine when marriages are arranged. Boundaries can be liberating. Not having to choose your own spouse allows you to focus on other things. Searching for a more fluid banking situation, are we? You need to lower yourself to my level for quick cash. You've discussed all this, Dabba. Don't rub it in. I'd like to hear her say it. I need to know how far she's willing to take this, followed by... The Empire's new regulations, made without Senate consultation, I might add. I agree with you that the Empire is overreaching. I am like you. Don't feel tarnished by taking my money. What will it cost? Stop trying to butter me up and tell me what you really want. I won't be in your pocket. I'd like a return invitation. Like a lot of gangsters, what he wants is the power of legitimacy. Like Vito told Michael, I never wanted this life for you. I thought you'd be Senator Corleone. I have a 14-year-old son. I want to be in your family. What makes you think I approve of that tradition? I won't marry off my daughter like it's the Middle Ages, implying that she had to go through the same thing and she won't have this happen to her own daughter. Our position sometimes makes decisions for us, don't you find? You have no choice. And by the way, Mon's daughter is named Leda, just like she was in the old Expanded Universe novels. And then we get to the capper. After Mon Mothma says she's not thinking about his offer, he says, That's the first untrue thing you've said. Mm, amazing scene. And then we go to Clea, who's setting up another clandestine meeting, this one with Luthen and Lonnie, the Imperial spy. What is it with gingers being spies? I'm the spy. She knows he wanted to meet because he left marks on the fountain, similar to the marks that Vel left when they had their meeting. Every episode, I try to mention another Easter egg in Luthen's shop, like this mural of hands that we saw in Star Wars Rebels, this Jedi holocron, a Twilight Calicori, the Jedi Temple guard mask, and here, the headdress he's working on looks a lot like the one Padme wore in the prequels. And then we get a breathtaking 16 minute prison escape sequence that is at the heart of the episode and it starts off with the coolest handoff since office space and or sneaks into the back to cut away from the pipe reminiscent of andy dufresne using his rock hammer in the shawshank redemption now it took me a little while to realize that Andor's goal was to burst the pipe i thought he just wanted to use some component from this toilet to escape in fact when the water spilled i thought it was like a ticking clock like everybody would die if the water spread onto the floor Good thing I've never tried to escape a prison because they have worked out that an electrified wet floor would short out all the power, which is a great surprise. The sequence is so good. The stillness of this pause. Intercut with the violence of the gushing water. It is so perfectly paced, just brilliant. It's also so good that Kino repeats the intercom announcement. New man on the floor! Hold your positions! But, like Mon Mothma's conversation, there's a double meaning here. He's telling them, don't attack yet. Oh, and the Imperials are using Imperial blaster pistols like we first saw in A New Hope. Earlier, we talked about how Cassian was saying that fear was their greatest weapon, and we see this right off the bat. As soon as one thing does not go according to plan, the Imperials panic, so they shock the new prisoner, and that sets this guy up to use the weapon against the guard. Later, they're so panicked that they even shock the floor, even though the inmates are all on tables. So then Kino gives the real order, and suddenly they're making weapons out of whatever they have around them, much like the Ewoks. <laughs> Now, symbolically, a few different things are happening during this break. The prisoners have to rise up through the complex, much like the Rebellion rising up against the Empire. Like I pointed out last week, this is also mirroring the ending of George Lucas' THX 1138. Also, like in THX, the guards are wearing black and the heroes are in white. We hear shouts of... Come on! Which is literal, they have to climb. But remember, this is what Nimic yelled to Cassian. In fact, I think they were his last words. Climb! And it's also what K2SO shouted to him on Scarif. Yeah. Climb! Climb! And now, climbing has become their mission, to climb up out of the hole the Empire placed them in. Then we see water trickling down to the lower levels. This is symbolic of how the isolated rebel cells across the galaxy slowly banded together into a cohesive military force, from the efforts of people like Luthen and Mon Mothma. So, when Kino and Andor finally get to the control center, all the Imperial can say is... You shouldn't be here. Because this guy is essentially a living machine. He can't think for himself, he can only input data. And what he's basically saying here is, Does not compute. Does not compute. 
The map of the complex is dark, and the inmates are depicted as dots of light. In Star Wars, light is always symbolizing the good guys, facing off against the dark side of the Force. But in this case, the lights are more like flickers of hope, like stars in the blackness of space. Kino leans over the desk, awkwardly at first, kind of like this. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? But then Kino makes an impassioned speech that sounds like a labor leader in the 1800s. Stop the work. Get out of your cells. Take charge and start climbing. Don't you be getting any ideas. You got a lot more to lose than your chance. I won't, buddy. High five. Cassian also tells the guards, On program! Now! And you know, the command they give prisoners also has a couple different meanings. On program can mean follow the program, the plan that we've laid out for you. But you also program computers and machines. THX 1138 was about a human being breaking free from machine control because the machines were using drugs to program him to behave like a machine, to suppress his emotions. And just like in THX, the prisoners escape by entering the light. But there we learn the sad irony of Kino's story. Can't swim. Much like Moses, he's one leader who can never enter the promised land. And this brilliant overhead shot of them escaping is the reverse of showing their dots on the board. Instead of lights trapped in a sea of darkness, they are streaks of white escaping outward into the light. But then we go further into the darkness, literally and figuratively. Lonnie meets Luthen in the depths of Coruscant. Now, we've talked on the channel before about how the lower levels of Coruscant are where the poor live and where the underworld thrives. But now, they've actually gone several miles underground into the depths of the machine that run the city. If the Empire is a beast, then this is the belly of that beast. And as Luthen says, this is where he lives now. Lonnie is coming to tip Luthen off about the raid on Krieger at the Rings of Kalfried, where we first met Andor in Rogue One. Now, in that scene, Andor sacrifices the life of another rebel to escape the Empire. And here we see that Luthen is willing to do the same. He would sacrifice Krieger and 50 of his soldiers just to keep his Imperial spy intact. And you know what? There are never any handrails in Star Wars. I just want a railing, you know, one railing right here. Then Stellan Skarsgård fires up this epic monologue filled with double meanings. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? Literally because of where he is standing and I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy. Like sacrificing people in order to win a war. And he delivers this monologue in the depths of the Imperial capital like he's trapped inside the depths of hell. And after his last line, I need all the heroes I can get. We cut to one of those heroes, Cassian Andor. Cassian has finally learned that he cannot escape the Empire, not with any amount of money. So now he and Melshi will likely run off and become the rebel soldiers that we first met in Rogue One. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs I found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.